Welcome to Poetry Live, Poetry Public Library. So, it's already past seven, so I'm going to get the gears cranking here. Why are we here? Probably because everybody likes poetry, or loves poetry, or likes to read poetry, or share poetry. It's a community celebration. So, some librarians, professors, teachers, students got together and thought there should be an event to come together and cram a bunch of poetry into two hours. So what we want to do is read as much possible poetry to each other as we can. Um, so it's kind of my task to keep things moving along and, and uh, have people um, come up and read one poem, no more than five minutes. So we can have as many people participate as possible. If we get through everybody, then we can start another round. So um, MSU Library, MSU English Department, English Club, Bozeman High School Library, Bozeman Public Library, and that's who put it together. And let's just unleash this thing and see what happens. I'm Tim Donnie. I'm a librarian. And I love poetry, and it changed my life. So I go to events like this and hang out with people like you. Words on their minds. Change your life for the worse, huh? Um, a little bit of that too, yeah. You gotta take the good with the bad. Poetry's risky. If you love it, you might have already found out. Okay, so the idea is I'll read the names, you just come up, you read your poem. If you're not signed up, you gotta sign up to be able to read it. Okay, and um, let's start this thing. Sound good? Good. A mic. Um, I don't feel like I need a mic, but it pivots. If you like the mic, make sure you got the mic. So I'll leave it here. And it, it, it rises too. Although who knows if this thing falls apart if you adjust it. I'll let you try to find out about that. It seems to be working. All right. So I'm going to start off with a quick poem. It's called Lying in a Hammock at William Duffy's Farm in Pine Island, Minnesota. And it's by James Wright. Over my head, I see the brown bronze butterfly asleep on the black trunk, blowing like a leaf in green shadow. Down the ravine behind the empty house, the cowbells follow one another into the distances of the afternoon. To my right, in a field of sunlight between two pines, the droppings of last year's horses blaze up into golden stones. I lean back as evening darkens and comes on. A chicken hawk floats over, looking for home. I have wasted my life.
and see you in the future triple his size, slapping that ball effortlessly, your face smooth and handsome, maybe talking to friends. I'm paralyzed in the July sun, watching with you as that dirty ball on its guiding rope slowly stops, turns back, and gaining speed now, including your mouth.
Jan, we love you. Go on next. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming tonight. This is like my favorite thing. <laughs> and you're all here. And I just have to say, I really love poets. I am not a poet. So I am reading someone else's poetry. But I'm reading the poetry of a really cool guy. He's, um, his name is Ben Okri. And he is a Nigerian British poet. And I got to meet him last year when I was in Oxford at the Oxford Literary Festival. And he's the coolest guy. He's so great. So I thought, well, I have to read some of this stuff. This is different because it's prose poetry. And I'm just going to read excerpts from a longer prose poem called Poetry in Life. And um, it has sort of chapters in it. I'm just going to read a couple chapters from it. Number one. Heaven knows we need poetry now more than ever. We need the awkward truth of poetry. We need its indirect insistence on the magic of listening. In a world of contending guns, the argument of bombs, and the madness of believing that only our side, our religion, our politics is right, a world fatally inclined toward war, we need the voice that speaks to the highest in us. We need the voice that speaks to our joys, our childhoods, and to the Gordian knots of our private and national condition. A voice that speaks to our doubts, our fears, and to all the unsuspected dimensions that make us both human and beings touched by the whispering of stars. Number four. Poetry is not just what poets write. <coughs> Poetry is also the great river of soul murmurings that runs within humanity. Poets merely bring this underground river to the surface for a moment. Here and there, in cascades of sound and suggested meaning through significant form. Number eight. Poets want nothing from you, only that you listen to their deepest selves. Unlike politicians, they don't want your votes. True poets just want you to honor the original pact you made with the universe when you drew your first breath from the unseen magic in the air. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Okay, next, one of my favorite Bozeman poets, Sir Dancer. Voila! Voila! <laughs> yeah, no, you don't know how, how to spell this. This is voila. This was a, a contest I entered that was, uh, you're supposed to write about uh, war and peace and how a war is bad, peace is good, uh, people get hurt. So here's how I, I came out on uh, this. The violet flame consumes the violent games, the cosmic mimic was making quite some cosmic mimicry, which was well beyond mere machine-based biomimicry, crying like a motherless child, swimming in bad vibes, then climbing imaginary walls to try to cling to the transparent parent to blubber for scriptural guidance. Grow up, said some non-thing. The war-torn world is not all that bad here, chucklehead. And getting tensed up like a stressed up, messed up poetaster would be such a disaster. A poetaster is a bad poet. Now you learned another word, apparently. In fact, there are some mouth-watering, non-foods, and eye-popping, invisible thrills, and ineffable explanations here to all this. It's not all that bad, bad baby, the disembodied voice said. The war is in your head, Cracker Jack. The conflict intensifies by your tension, and the global warming comes from the heavy energy of you just rubbing people the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> and more. You got boring in your members, a chattering in your brain, and if you continue to make secret cuts <coughs> at those you disagree with, you know, the cosmic mimic is 
going to appear again and up your ante. And if you are so anti this and anti that and anti antibiotics and antibacterial, you are going to be such a sick puppy. And more. You who are hating corporations, baiting Republicans, and only ogling the seat of power with a leer sneer. Wait! I'm freaking me out! Wait! I'm, freak I'm freaking me out! shouted the peace freak. No, I mean I'm not mean. I mean you make me out to be mean, and you make me them. Cheek to jowl, the testy protester and the cosmic mind were then at it, soon down on the proverbial monkey pile line. The monkey mind pile trying to shout peace down each other's throat of thought, each feeling super superior, hot under the collar when, lo and behold, so that spark starts the Holy Spirit to burst flames of sweetheart contact, twin fires of true love, at one meant heat to do its perfect work, within and without, with e without ever going out. Sir Dancer on uh, 11, 11 months, 12, 12 years. <laughs>
walker that passed her by, the by passed her, and tell with my shoveling to kill him.
title of this poem is Ellie and the Thousand Cranes. <coughs> and the inspiration for my poem is Ellie, nine-year-old Ellie. On the way up to the ski hill, Ellie tells me in fourth grade English they are reading the story about the girl made sick by the bomb that fell on her city. She's folding a thousand cranes so she can make one magic wish. It's a perfect day in Montana. The mountains unfurl in pristine peaks, snowy against the blue. All winter, Ellie has been making paper hats, boats, mitts, chairs, birds. Origami Nation occupies her home and mine. <laughs> Ellie says, matter of fact, the girl in the story is now in the hospital, is probably going to die. But, Ellie tells me, she wants to be young and hip. Then she skis off. Come the Montana spring, the sand hills who mate for life will return. Meanwhile, Ellie and I go skiing. Imagine <coughs> the wonder of a thousand cranes flying over Japan.